Okay, if you recall Monday, we talked about using the gas laws and what happens when they change temperatures and pressures and volumes and that kind of thing. That's fine. We ended with talking about the ideal gas law, which is here, right? The main important part of this that we're going to use as we move forward in more calculations is actually just this little n. What does that n mean again? Moles. Moles. All right. So by calculating for that n, we're going to be able to put gases into our stoichiometry problems that we've already been doing, limiting reagents and all that kind of stuff. The difference is, and I think this actually makes it easier, is that we actually know the volume, uh, the number of moles in a certain volume of an ideal gas at a given temperature and pressure. Uh, and it's actually the same for every gas. So it saves you a calculation because to find the moles of a gas, as long as you know the container and that kind of stuff, you often don't need to find the molecular weight. You don't need to do the calculations. You just need to know this one number. And this is the number. 22.4 liters. There are 22.4 liters in volume of an ideal gas, of one mole of an ideal gas at zero degrees C and one atmosphere. So if you're at that temperature and that pressure, any gas at all will take up the same volume which is 22.4 liters, supposing that there is one mole. Now when we get into the kinetic molecular theory in the end of the later part of the chapter, we'll talk about why that is. But essentially, gases are so spread out that the size of any given molecule matters much less than the space between molecules. And the forces among molecules, the intermolecular forces, matter much less than uh, because the, the molecules are so far apart. So whether you have two helium atoms or you have two radon atoms, those gases behave essentially the same when it comes to volume because a, a gas is so spread out. So that's why we can make this generalization that, a molar vol that there is a molar volume of, a, of an ideal gas, meaning all gases take up the same space at the same conditions, uh, at the same amounts. All right? So that those particular... Conditions, 0 degrees C and 1 ATM, are known as standard temperature and pressure, or STP. Okay? Uh, of course, 0 degrees C is 273K, 1 atmosphere, atmospheric pressure. So a lot of times, we'll be doing calculations dealing with STP. A given gas is at STP. If you hear that, that just means that you can use, you automatically know the pressure and the temperature. 1 atmosphere, 273K. How many uh, tor? Going back to Monday, anybody remember that number? 760. 760. Good, good. All right, so then we can do problems like this. Quick lime is produced by the thermal decomposition of calcium carbonate. Calculate the volume of CO2 at STP produced from the decomposition of calcium carbonate to form 152 grams of calcium oxide. So now, this actually is looking more like a limiting reactant stoichiometry type problem. Maybe not really limiting because we don't know the initial uh, amounts. But it's looking like a stoichiometry problem. Um, so what do you think the first step is here? How do we set this up? Write the equation. What's that equation going to look like? Well, remember, CAO is produced. So that's going to be over on this side. What's on the other side? Right, the calcium carbonate decomposes, and it doesn't say it decomposes in the presence of oxygen or anything like that, it just says decomposes, so that we assume that's the only reagent, and it forms calcium oxide and ca carbon dioxide gas. Is that balanced? I think it is, yeah. All right, and let's look at the other information that we're given. So we formed 152 grams of calcium oxide, and we want to know the volume of CO2 produced. We know it's at STP, so we know we're at 0 degrees C and 1 ATM. 
What do you think we're going to need to find to figure out the volume of carbon dioxide? The moles, the moles right, because when we know the moles of a gas, we know the volume of the gas. All right, how do we find moles of CO2 then? Right, so first we have to find the moles of the calcium oxide. The molar mass of uh, calcium oxide is about 56 grams per mole. So that gives us 2.78 grams, whoops, 2.7 moles calcium oxide. All right, so if we make, make 2.7 moles of calcium oxide, how much carbon dioxide do we make? The same. Now, since we're at STP, we can use that 22.4 number to figure out the volume. There's always 22.4 liters of gas in one mole at STP. So that gives us 60.5 liters. All right, do you get the idea? Yeah. All right, let's try another one. This time, we're a little bit different because we're not at STP. So what happens then if you're not at STP? Right, and how, do we, how would we calculate volume? Because we're still given pressure and temperature. So if we know pressure and temperature, how do we calculate volume? Yeah, the ideal gas law. So we'll get the number of moles, or, or maybe we have to calculate the number of moles. I don't know. It says volume. So we'll get the number of moles, and we'll use PV equals NRT instead. So that 22.4 is kind of a shorthand when you're at STP. Um, if you're not, then it's easier to just use the ideal gas law. So why don't you try to set this one up on your own or with your uh, neighbors, and then we'll go through it and see what you think. Same spot now. Let's look at the equation. Should look like that, right? And then we've got some information for each of these initial gases. So we know methane is 2.80 liters uh, to K. And then the oxygen, 35 liters. Uh, yeah, what temperature is that? Three O K one point two five atmospheres. All right. So then we need to find the moles of those gases, right? Because once we know moles, then we can solve the limiting reagent thing and figure out the moles of CO two. Uh, so how did you find the moles of these of either of these? Right, we can rearrange the ideal gas law. To find moles. Anybody calculate that out? How many moles are the of, of methane? And how many moles of oxygen? So what's the limiting reagent here? That's right. So you do have two to one oxygen, but there's still way more oxygen than just <coughs> two times this. So methane must be the limiting rea reagent, which means how much carbon dioxide is formed? The same amount, because these are in a one to one ratio. Time, what times two? Two to one, 
but this is one to one, right? One to one. Okay, so we know the moles of carbon dioxide formed. How do we find the volume of carbon dioxide formed, which is what the question asks for? Yeah, we go back to the uh, gas law, but this time we're solving for volume. And we know that the temperature now is 15 degrees C and the pressure is 2.5 atm. And, and we know the moles, so this is going to be 0.192 moles times R. times T, which in this case is uh, 15 degrees C or 288K over the pressure 2.50 ATM. And that is, I believe, 1.79 liters. What? Uh, yes, but we haven't gotten to that part yet, so let's talk about that later. Is that not right? No, that's right, because uh, the end, the CO2 formed, is at 15 degrees C, which is 288K. Okay, so if let's think about what we did in order. Essentially, it was the same as all those problems we've done before and the quiz problem. You find the moles of things, right? You find the limiting reagent, you figure out a theoretical yield in moles. The only difference here is that we're using the ideal gas law to, to calculate moles from pressures, volumes, and temperatures rather than using molar masses to calculate pressures, volumes, and temperatures. Okay? Otherwise, the problem's the same. You gotta have your equation, you gotta look for the molar ratio, limiting reagent, theoretical yield, all that stuff is the same. Uh, you just plug it into a different equation later. Right. So what about molar mass of a gas? The molar mass, recall, hopefully you recall, that molar mass is mass in grams divided by moles, right? That's not new information for anybody, I hope. So we can rearrange this based on what we now know about gases. Remember, we called moles n in, in, the, in the gas law, right? So solving for, for n, n equals grams of gas over the molar mass. So we solve this for n, and you get grams over big M, which is the molar mass. Using that, we can rearrange, not rearrange, but we can substitute in the gas law which, remember, is PV equals nRT. If we use this N in place of this N, we get PV equals uh, oops, the grams times RT over the molar mass. I thought molarity is... Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> but this isn't molarity. This is molar mass. Oh. Should we use a different symbol for that? I use an MW. Yeah, let's do that. I believe the book uses M, but it's a it's a different like font, so that's how they separate it from molarity. But we can use molecular weight to keep it clear. Uh, and in fact, yeah. So then we can. We can rearrange this further by um, switching molecular weight and volume. And the reason we do that is we can now have P times the molecular weight equals GRT over V. But what's this? What's the mass divided by volume? Density. So we can say that the pressure times the molecular weight equals the density times RT. 
Or we can actually solve for molar mass and say that molar mass equals the density times RT over the pressure. This is, the reason this is important, all that stuff that we just went through, is that it allows us to, get, to calculate the molar mass of a gas by measuring its density, its temperature, and its pressure. Those are all things that we can measure. We can't measure molecular weight, right? And for a solid, thanks. For a solid, we have no way of, of like just measuring it and then knowing the molecular weight unless we look up the density or something. But for a gas, because, uh, because all gases take up the same amount of space when you have the same number of moles, we can measure a gas's density, and we can measure the temperature and the pressure, and we can actually figure out what gas it is based on the um, molecular weight. So let's do a couple calculations first um, forward. We can also determine the density of a gas if we know its identity. For instance, nitrogen gas. See if you can plug that into that equation and calculate for the density of nitrogen gas at 125 degrees C and a pressure of 755 millimeters of mercury. mercury. Can you just keep going just in the beginning? Like that? So see if you can, oops, sorry. See if you can do that calculation. Uh, you're using this equation, you're solving for density, and you should know all of the other ones. Or you can find all of the other ones. Just here. 0.852 uh, grams per liter. So we have to plug into this equation, but we also need to convert our temperature and our pressure, right? So 755 millimeters of mercury. All right, um, so then we can say that the, and we know the, what's the molecular weight? 28 grams, because uh, grams per mole, 0.2, yeah, um, of nitrogen. And that's going to be this density that we're trying to solve for, times R <coughs> times T, uh, which in this case is 398. Okay. Divided by our pressure and atmospheres. So if we solve for D, we get. Is that right? Okay. Now you do have to be a little bit careful with units here. Because our R is in liter atmospheres uh, per mole Kelvin, our density comes out as grams per liter. Whereas usually, we, we report density in uh, grams per cubic centimeter or grams per milliliter. So just beware of this, of this calculation, that this is actually grams per liter, not grams per milliliter. Um, keep your units straight there. Okay, before we go on, let's do another one, but the opposite way. So, similar problem. An experiment shows that a 248 milliliter gas sample has a mass of 0.433 grams, blah, 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 blah. What is the molar mass of the gas? So this is kind of the opposite calculation now. We're gonna, we know the other stuff, we're gonna calculate the molar mass. But you'll note here that we're not given the density. How do we find the density? Right, we know the mass, we know the volume, so we can find the density. Mass is 0.433 grams divided by the volume, um, 0.248 liters. Now, you could also find the density in, in the milliliters and have a density in units of grams per milliliter. That's fine, but then you have to note that when you go back to the other equation, your R is in liters, this is in milliliters, those aren't going to cancel right, okay? So um, just keep your units straight. It doesn't matter which units you use, just keep them straight so they're always consistent throughout your calculations. Uh, what is that number?
Okay, so the density is 1.75 grams per liter. So then we can plug this into our equation. Yes, so that's the other issue here. DRT over P, but we have to convert our temperature and pressure to fit our R. Uh, the temperature is going to be um, 301. And 745 millimeters of mercury is 0 0.980 atm. So then the molecular weight comes out to... So this question, question could have been a little bit trickier and asked you, what is the identity of this gas? How do you think you would go about that? Uh, yeah, it's kind of trial and error. You'd have to try some stuff and see what you can get that actually adds up to 44.1 uh, that's a gas. So what are some possibilities here? Uh, you could look at some of the hydrocarbons, so it could be if it's a CH type thing, what would that have to be? Maybe a C, C3H8, that fits, right? That's a gas, that's propane. Um, also it could be maybe NO2. Does NO2 work? NO2 doesn't quite work, right? So NO2 is 46, so that doesn't work. So I think C3H8 works. But essentially this is, yes, trial and error. You have to just kind of add stuff together, kind of like with the mass spec, and figure out what, um, what it might be. Questions about this? Density, molecular weight stuff? All right, so when you're learning this, uh, couple ways you could do it depending on your, the way you like to do things, the way you like to study. So one way is to just remember this, this equation. Molar mass equals dRT over P. If you're the sort of person who likes, who can take a list of equations and just sort of memorize them, great, that works fine. The other thing to do is to go through these first couple steps where we showed how we could derive that equation from PV equals nRT by just substituting stuff in. So if your brain works more that way, when you, where you like to just figure things out from first principles, that's fine too. And then you don't remember the actual equation, you just have a sense of the algebra and how to play with things. So either way, uh, you want to do that, whatever your style is of studying. Um, when you, when you want to check yourself, get to these problems and just make sure that you can go through and do them without looking anything up. All right. Questions? OK, we have a little more time. So we're just going to finish up the, uh, the rest of the sort of mathy part of the chapter before we get into the non-mathy part, um, which is the kinetic molecular theory. This, this part, I, I think it makes sense, but it's always a little bit confusing. So let me know if, if something is, it makes you uncomfortable or you're stuck or, or this isn't really making sense to you. It's this idea of partial pressures. And I think the basic law, Dalton's law, which is this, is fairly straightforward. It's all the stuff that comes from it that tends to confuse people. So Dalton's law just says if you have a bunch of gases there is a t in a container, there is a total pressure of that container, right? Total pressure of all the gas together. Dalton's law says all the individual gases to get uh, each, all their pressures added up make that total <coughs> pressure. So if you have a, 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 a container with one atmosphere of pressure, and it's got three different gases in it, one gas, let's say, is going to have 0.2 atmospheres of pressure, one gas is 0.6, and then another one is 0.2. All the pressures of the individual gases have to add up to the total pressure. So that's all that is. All right. And now here are all the consequences that come from it and how we do some of these calculations. 
I don't want to go through the whole derivation. Um, I, I kind of want to get to the problem so you can see how it's applied. But essentially, you can do all the stuff that we've been doing with one big sample of one gas with these individual partial pressures. So you can solve for partial m numbers of moles, right? You can use basically use the ideal gas law for each of those partial pressures based on their partial numbers of moles. And you'll note that the temperature and volume stays the same. So we don't have partial volumes and partial temperatures. All the gases take up the same volume and are at the same temperature, but the pressures they exert are different and they add up to the overall pressure in the container. So what this tells us is that we can use partial pressures and partial numbers of moles to figure out how much of each type of gas is in a given container. And similarly, if we know how much of each kind of gas is in a given container, we can figure out the overall pressure, the overall um, you know, volume or whatever else we're looking for using the ideal gas law. So here's how this works. Uh, this problem is talking about a scuba diving tank. You can use a mixture of helium and oxygen in that tank. For a particular dive, 46 liters of helium at 25 degrees C and 1 atm and 12 liters of oxygen at the same temperature and pressure were pumped into a tank with a volume of 5 liters. Calculate the partial pressure of each gas and the total <laughs> pressure in the tank. So to figure this out, we're going to look at the uh, amount of moles of each gas and then essentially convert it to the new situation. We could also use the P1V1 over T1 for each of these gases. Um, but let's do it ideal gas way because it'll make more sense when we get a little fancier in a minute. What we do is we say, okay, the pressure of helium, just the helium that we start with, we can solve from those initial conditions. 46 liters, 25 degrees C, 1 atm. So P, um, or I'm sorry, we, no, we need to get the moles first. The moles of helium, not the pressure. We know the pressure. The moles of helium, we solve from our normal gas law methods. We've got 1 atm. 46 liters, 1 and T, which is 298K. And that is 1.88 moles. OK. 1.88 moles of helium. So now let's also get the moles of oxygen. We got 12 liters, 25, 1 atmosphere. Same procedure. Put all that stuff in there, and you get 0 0.46 something moles, or no, 0 0.49 moles. Okay. So that's how many moles of each we start with. And the key to this problem is you don't change the amount of helium or oxygen. We're putting that many moles of each into this new container. We are changing the volume and we are changing the pressure but we're taking the same numbers of moles and putting them in. So we're taking the 1.88 moles of helium, the 0.49 moles of oxygen, and putting them into this new container with a new <laughs> size, 5 liters. So we need to figure out the pressure of this new container. And the only way we can do that is by figuring out the partial pressures of the two individual gases and adding them together. So that's what we're going to do. The partial pressure in the new container of helium is going to be the moles of helium times RT over V, so same ideal gas law stuff. 
and that's 1.88 moles times, uh, and the new temperature hasn't changed, so we'll assume it's the same temperature. But the new volume has changed. The new volume is 5 liters. And so that's going to be 9.2, or is that not right? 9 point something? Okay. 9.2 ATMs. So that's the partial pressure of helium in the new container meaning just the helium atoms are producing that much pressure. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing with the oxygen. The partial pressure of oxygen in that new container we use the number of moles of oxygen which is 0.49 And again, we have 5 liter container. So the partial pressure of oxygen is 2.4 atmospheres. Okay. So that's the partial pressure of each gas in the final container. To find the total pressure, we just sum the partial pressure. So that's Dalton's law. The total pressure is the sum of the partial pressures. Which is 11.6 <coughs> atmospheres. Okay? So you see, we didn't do anything new there in terms of finding the individual pressures. There weren't any new equations. It's just the ideal gas stuff from before. But we add them up at the end. All right, so the final piece of this is talking about the mole fraction. Has anybody heard of mole fraction before? Okay. Mole fraction is the number of moles of something, of a part of a mixture, divided by the total number of moles. So we talked about percent mass back in chapter 1 or chapter 2, where we, we calculated percent by mass. Uh, like you could say the percent of phosphorus in sodium phosphate or something. This is the same idea, but with moles. The number of moles of one thing divided by the total number of moles is called the mole fraction. So again, we can substitute the ideal gas law. If, if the number of mole, the mole fraction is given by this uh, Greek letter pi or he depending on how you like to pronounce that. Um, or x, if you prefer to just. <laughs> um, but you can see the moles of 1 divided by the sum of all the moles of everything. And once again, we can substitute for the ideal gas law, n equals p times v over rt. And what we get is that each individual mole fraction is proportional to the partial pressure times v over rt. So essentially, the mole fraction, which is the ratio of the moles of one thing to the total moles, equals the partial pressure of one thing to the total pressure. So this gives us an easy way to go from pressures to moles um, using mole fraction, like this. Here, here's a, a, a simple version of this problem. And then we'll, uh, we probably won't have time today, but we'll, we'll get into some issues with that next time. The partial pressure of oxygen was observed to be 156 torr in air. And the total atmospheric pressure is 743 torr. So first of all, if your total atmospheric pressure of 743 is 743 torr, where are you relative to sea level? Are you, you're, you're above it, right? We're above sea level because the pressure, the atmospheric pressure is below 760, which is atmospheric pressure at sea level. Okay. 
So we can actually figure out the mole fraction of oxygen in the air. That is the ratio between the number of moles of oxygen and the total number of moles by using the equivalence oops, I'm in the wrong thing here. There we go. By using the equivalence, it says that the mole fraction of oxygen equals the ratio of the partial pressures. We don't know the total number of moles in the air. So we can't use the normal equation for mole fraction. But we do know the total pressure. That's 156 tor divided by 743 tor 0.209. So the air is about 21% oxygen by moles. 21% of the moles of air are oxygen based on these numbers at this, in, in these conditions. It doesn't have units. You see the units cancel out. So as long as you've got the same units for both, you don't have to worry about that. And so then the other part of that, yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, but the other part of that is that you can rearrange this. See this equation here? You can rearrange this and say that the partial pressure equals the mole fraction times the total pressure. So depending on what you have and what you want to know, you can use that equation to find different things. So if you have the mole fraction, you want to know the, the partial pressure, you can do that. If you have the partial pressure and you want to know the mole fraction, you can do that as well. So the other way to ask that question is like this. The mole fraction of nitrogen is this. Calculate the partial pressure when atmospheric pressure is 760 torr. And you do that in the same way. So partial pressure of nitrogen is the mole fraction of nitrogen times the total pressure, which in this case is 0 0.7808 times 760 torr, 593. Torah. Yeah. So we don't have to convert back to M for atmospheres? You only have to worry about that when you're dealing with R because you need the R units to cancel out. Okay. So the only unit that you ever always need to convert for all these calculations is temperature. Always needs to be in Kelvin because it's an additive conversion. Other ones you just have to keep it consistent. So next time we'll talk about how this applies to collecting gases over water and then we'll, we'll move on to the kinetic molecular theory.